Okay. Um, my name is Michael Davies, and uh, I'm going to talk today about getting your CFP abstract accepted. Because, you know what? This conference is a special conference, isn't it? And what I want to do today is to help all of you guys be better at putting in abstracts. And so hopefully we can get you on this side of this platform and so you can be a speaker at this conference. That's kind of the goal of this talk. But I know this is the last talk of the day. I know that you probably need food and you probably, probably need coffee. So let me, just, let, me just, let me just ask just one thing to start with. How many of you have put something into the CFP before, has, has made a submission to the CFP? Hands up. Yep, that's good. Uh, how many of you have put something into the CFP and it got rejected? About the same number of people. Good. <laughs> it means that I'm not wasting my time. This is good. Do what I want. Good. Um, very quickly, just about me. Um, so I, I came to the first conference, which, uh, which Rusty organised in 1999. And, um, uh, I was so badly damaged, it took uh, about five years before uh, we ran the conference in Adelaide uh, in 2004. But that really uh, sparked an interest in me that I wanted to be part of this conference to continue to, to help it to keep going. And so since 2004, I've been involved in the Papers Committee. And uh, of those 10 years, I've been co-chair of the Papers Committee half that time, so for five years. So I've seen an awful lot of really good abstracts and a couple of bad ones. Um, and so I guess the other side is that I just want to say that I'm willing to talk to any of you about any CFP submission you make or perhaps an idea that you might have that you might think is a great conference talk. I want to talk to you about that so we can get that to the stage where we can accept it to the conference. And um, the last point there, I do work for Rackspace on upstream OpenStack and Rackspace is an awesome company. Right. So the problem that we've got is you've put a proposal into the CFP and it got rejected. But the thing is, is that you thought it was a pretty awesome abstract, and you thought it was going to be a fantastic talk, and you thought, man, I can be just like Rusty one day. <laughs> but the problem is, is that stupid bunch of self-righteous gits on the paper committee didn't accept my talk. And they've been doing it for the past three years. What am I doing wrong? Hopefully today we're going to cover some of that. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to look a little bit about how the paper committee works, uh, and some good and bad abstracts and some uh, good and bad, uh, or some examples of those. And then also, we'll see if we can get some hints together as well. So how the paper committee works, um, it's full of experienced LCAs. Uh, this, this past year, uh, 2014, our uh, papers committee had 28 people on it. And they're all people who are actively involved in our community. Uh, so, and they're also very uh, familiar with the culture of our conference because we want to maintain that culture going forward. We don't want to switch, switch out every year. We don't want a whole bunch of new people every year because we want to maintain the same feel of the conference uh, on the technical side of things, on, on the papers side. So what we do is we take, last year's, uh, we take last year's papers committee and we make a few changes. Like some people drop out because they're too busy or maybe they uh, you know, just haven't got around to reviewing papers. So that's okay, we, can, you know, we, we allow people to come and go. Uh, but then we select new people. And what we do is when we select new people, and this has really been a focus, I guess, in maybe in the last four or five years, is to really consider the balance of the papers committee. Because even though this thing started with a, a, a really heavy focus on uh, kernel developers, this conference is more than just kernel developers. We want balance, right? We want to cover the, the, the width and breadth of the open source community. So the way that we do that is that we try to improve our gender diversity on the papers committee. We have people who write web applications and desktop <laughs> applications, uh, who do programming, who do kernel work, uh, who are involved in uh, software and hardware and uh, creative commons and community and Haxon. We have trying to get involvement right across the whole side of the open source community. We want that representation on the papers committee. And the reason for that is because we want that kind of representation in the conference. And so we, we're talking about software developers, sysadmins, network administrators, uh, technical writers, everybody. So we, we try to improve that. And so that's, and that's one of the ways that we try to improve the culture. And so by doing that, we means that we have subject matter experts across all areas. So now it doesn't matter what you put your talk in, hopefully we've got someone on the papers committee who can talk and say whether that's a good idea or not, or whether you're just smoking crack, right? So where do abstracts come from? Um, we put together a CFP, a call for papers, a call for presentations, and we mail that out to the community and we make use of mailing lists. 
which is pretty standard. We make use of social media nowadays. Uh, LWN are very kind to us and they put out uh, the CFP for us as well. But I also know that a lot of you guys, when you get the CFP, you send it off to internal company <coughs> mailing lists. And that's a great thing, to, to develop a mailing list. And we also make approaches to uh, previous speakers as well, saying, hey, you spoke in a previous year, why don't you think about coming back again? And maybe, why don't you invite some other people that you know who are doing some really good things? The other thing that we do is we make individual approaches. And what we do is that we, uh, both the papers committee and also the core organising team for the conference, we come up with a list of speakers and topics that we would like to see at the conference. And then we target those individuals and groups. So we go after them, we say, hey, I know you've never heard of us, but wouldn't it be good, you know, consider our CFP and come along to LCA? And what we're finding is increasingly people have heard of LCA, which is a great thing. How do we score our abstracts? You know, you, you might be wondering, well, how do they decide whether my abstract's any good or not? Is it just, you know, Michael sitting in a room by himself just saying, eh, don't like that one, eh, don't like that one? We actually make use of some software called Zookeeper, which we developed in 2007, and uh, that is what you uh, use when you put something into the CFP straight away. Uh, it's also what we use to review our papers and also what uh, does all the uh, statistics for us, looks at the mean and standard deviation and these kind of things. And just so you know, it's not just me talking about, well, look, reading your abstract. The, th the fact is, is that we have 28 people on the papers committee, and so generally we get at least eight reviews on your abstract by eight different people. So eight different people look at your abstract and say, does this make sense to me? Is this something that we think delegates will want? We'll look at what the, what the criteria is a bit later, but we try to get lots of eyeballs on your abstract. It's not just one person or two people having a look at that. And, uh, and that's probably a little bit conservative. Uh, certainly this year I think we're up more like 10 or 11 uh, reviewers per abstract across the whole board. So if you think about it, we have round about 300 abstracts that get put in every year, 250 to 300. And if we're doing, say, eight reviews per abstract, that's an awful lot of reviews. That's like 2,400 reviews that each of our 28 people on our papers committee are doing. Oh, and we only give them two weeks to do it. So if you do the math, you work out, that's around about 40 hours of reviewing if they went non-stop, which of course they don't. But it's a lot, lot of work. So I just want to give you a bit of an understanding about just the amount of work that the papers committee have to go through to look at your abstracts. But, we, but obviously we want lots of them so we can get the best conference we can. Actually, I'll just go back for a sec. Um, so just looking at the timeline, what we do is we put out the CFP, it's open for several months, you submit them or through that time, and then we close the CFP. And then we, over about a two week period, we review all of those abstracts, we go nuts and go crazy, and one of the other benefits of us doing it in a small period of time is consistency. It's not like I did it months ago and now I'm doing it again, and you know, all that talk from this person on something or other I, I rated really well, but now at the end I'm running out of time and I'm gonna rate that one badly because I do it in a short period of time, it gives some consistency to those. Uh, and then what we do at the end of that two week period is that we uh, have a face-to-face -face meeting when we go through all the scores, look at all of the means, all the standard deviations, and we go, you know what, this is the set of papers, but we'll get to that in a moment. But that takes us to something called iterative review, because you, think, you might think to yourself, well, what happens if you know, I just make a couple of small mistakes? Am I just unlucky that I'm missing out every time I'm putting something in? Well, we have this process with the iterative review process where you might put your CFP in and you know, we will, we'll have a look at it and we'll go, you know what, that's almost there, but it's not quite right. You might have, there's some reasons there on the screen. I mean, for example, you might not have, have released the software. And it's like, we're not gonna put a talk, we're not gonna allow a talk to get up that's not about free software. So, hey, how about publishing that code? Or how about giving us a timeline when you are gonna publish that code? Or, you know, maybe there's some other bits and pieces there as it talks about there. Uh, maybe, can you just clarify a little bit more what you're talking about? So we go through this process with authors, if they're close, but not quite there, to help you get over the line, to help your, your abstract get accepted. And of course, then we have our face-to-face -face meeting. And the whole purpose of this face-to-face -face meeting, and, and what pretty much happens here is that uh, of that 28 people, probably around about 10 to 12 people will meet together face-to-face, -to -face, and we also make use of things like Google Hangouts and IRC. But we come together, and the, and the goal is, is that we walk into the room at 9 a.m. on one day, and we don't come out until 6 p.m. that night with a conference schedule. So we take all of the scoring that's gone on, uh, and we 
come out with a list of speakers, a list of backup speakers, and we actually schedule it as well. And then we hand that over to the core organising team. So how do we get through 300 abstracts that we're not going to, you know, it's just not simply a tick, no tick, you know, we're going to argue about these things. You know, I want to have this talk, but someone else wants that talk, and someone else thinks we're both crazy and they want something else. You know, how do we get through all of that material in that short period of time to come up with a conference uh, schedule? Well, if you think about it, if, if 10 to 12 people on the papers committee have all reviewed an abstract and they've all rated it well, either uh, you know, at a high score, then we should probably just auto accept it. You know, allowing for streaming and allowing for travel budget, we should just simply take that talk and accept it. Likewise, if, if 10 or 12 people on the papers committee have looked at that and said, you know what, I don't really like that very much, uh, we can probably auto reject that one. So we probably take 10% at the top end and 10% at the bottom end and we sort of push those away and then it's that middle 80% that we spend the whole day uh, arguing over. And there's some more information there. We also uh, classify the talks into streams and so the reason why we put them into streams of course is so that uh, we don't overload the conference with one particular thing. You know, uh, at the moment OpenStack is a big thing in, in the open source community but we don't want a whole conference full of OpenStack. <laughs> Go back a couple of years and some things in the desktop were really big. We had lots of GNOME talks. You, you look at other years and we've, you know, there's been lots of talks on you know, various different topics, but we try to balance the conference. We put it into streams. And part of that is because of a bit of, a, a bit of a, an, an unstated uh, goal. We want to make sure that all of you guys and girls, all of you, will have something that you can go to in every time slot. That's the goal, right? So it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what you do as a day job. If you've come to Linux Conf AU, we want you to be able to feel like there's something that you can go to in every single time slot throughout the conference. We actually put effort into this, right? There's no point us, even though we have balance in the conference, and even though we have all these, you know, we have this bunch of kernel talks, there's no point putting kernel talk, kernel talk, kernel talk, kernel talk, all in the same time slot, because the same people want to see them all. Right, so we, sh we schedule them out. And so we actually think about this. We think about um, the different kinds of LCA delegates that we've got. And we say, for these people, you know, what's, what's somebody who's involved in documentation going to see in this time slot? What's a kernel developer going to see in this time slot? What's a sysadmin, uh, a developer, you know, an application developer? So we go through all of that. And we also do things about looking at um, talk popularity and room allocation and all those kinds of things so we can deliver a schedule. So, how, you know, what are we actually doing when we are reviewing abstracts? Is it just some, you know, we count up the number of words and divide by three and make sure there's not too many vowels? Well, we, what we actually do is we look for people who, you know, it's basically the bottom line is it comes down to two things. We're looking for people who are a good speaker and are subject matter experts. There are other things as well, but you know, that's the bottom line. They're the two things that we want. We want to see that you are able to stand up in front of an audience and deliver your message. And we do that via verifiable experience. You know, we, we look to see where you've spoken before. Uh, we might, you, know, might have, you might have a recorded video. And maybe or someone else can stand up and say, you know what, I saw that person speak at my local lug or my local pearl mongers, and they really do know what they're talking about. They really are engaging with uh, the audience. The other thing is, is being a subject matter expert. We want to see that you actually know something about what you've proposed. So we look at uh, blog posts. Uh, project list emails, and we actually look for code commits or whatever that means you know, for your contribution to the open source community. We want to see that you're doing what you say that you're doing. Right? So they're really the, the two things that we, we are looking for as, as a papers committee. So what makes uh, a good abstract? Uh, a catchy, informative title. You know, we went through a stage there where we had a few cutesy titles that were, really didn't mean a whole lot. right? Um, but we want to get beyond that. We want to have a title though that draws you in, that actually makes you want to read the abstract. Because, you know, being honest, guys, when you decide what talk you're going to go to this week uh, in each time slot, you know, you don't read every single abstract. The first thing you do is you read, it, read the title and you go, oh, does this make sense? Is this something that might be interesting to me? And if it is, then you'll read the rest of the abstract. So you've got to have that good title. But we also then want an abstract that will tell a story. And I think that's what abstracts really are. They're telling a story. They're giving enough information to a delegate to say, come along and see this talk, or indeed enough to a, a papers committee member to say, we should accept that talk. Something that's going to be interesting. We need that abstract to clearly indicate that it's free software, 
And really, we want to really, the, really the reason you give a talk is there's got to be an outcome. What do you want? if you're going to put in an abstract and you're going to say, please accept my talk? What's the outcome that you want the listeners in the audience to take away? What are you trying to communicate? Are you just trying to go, oh, I worked on software X Y Z. Here's the release note. Well, that's no use to anyone. Anyone can read that online. What we actually want is a takeaway, something that you know will really uh, someone will take something away that's really useful. And I guess the uh, the test for this is, is actually the, uh, the Rusty side project test. If you've been to Rusty's um, uh, newcomer session, he says, oh man, the problem with LCA is I always come away with eight to ten side projects. Little things that, you know, as well as my day job, but these little things that I really want to hack on because I saw this excellent talk about it. That's what we want to cultivate, right? So when you present, you want people to go, man, that is really cool. I really like this project. I'm going to go spend time on that, right? So that's what you're trying to uh, do you trying to promote the project or the, or the topic that you're talking about? And I guess what we really want is this one here shows passion for the topic. We want to you want to leave us wanting more. When someone gives a presentation, you want us to go, "Wow, I am going to go check that out." I might have it over my phone. I'm going to write down the URL. I'm going to I'm going to go after this and have some fun. I'm going to go play with that tonight, straight after the penguin dinner. You know, I'm really enthusiastic about this. And so, but as a speaker, you need to communicate that passion, right? You need to engage your audience so they'll do that. Right, lots of words. Let's look at some specifics. Examples of good abstracts. So the first one I've got here is uh, from the canonical good speaker, uh, Tridge. And um, this is one of my actually favorite LCA talks that he gave. I'm, I'm, I'm not actually going to read it through, but I'll just skip to the next slide. Uh, and this shows a couple of things in the abstract that are really useful. You see, this was about Tridge roasting coffee using Linux. So he had a big heat gun that he po pointed at some coffee that was rotating around in a popcorn maker, and he was controlling the supply of the heat via a multimeter, but then he was controlling the multimeter from his laptop over USB. Okay, so that's pretty geeky, right? That's what our attendees, I see you're smiling, right? I think that's a really strange thing to do, but man, it's cool, right? So it passes that test. It's a geeky test, right? It's, it's a geeky thing to do. But then the other thing is, he was very sneaky. It's a dual purpose talk, right? Because the thing that interests me most is he showed how easy it was is to say, oh, I've got this multimeter here, uh, and I promise that I've never seen it before. And he just plugged it into his laptop, and he had some software there which was doing a USB, USB protocol sniffing. And he's like, huh, when I turn the knob, I get these bytes. Huh, I wonder what happens if I start poking bytes at it. Oh, that changes on the screen. So he actually showed the basis for writing a device driver for an unknown device. It was dual purpose. He, just, he said that he's going to give a demonstration. It was quite cool. It was quite noisy. <laughs> And he's, you know, showing how it was working. But he also showed how, you know, how he could, in real time, he was actually doing the basis of a, the start of a device driver. Why should you go there? Why should you go to this talk? He made it very clear. The techniques used are applicable to the problem of writing device drivers for a wide range of undocumented devices. Huh. So this is a really good abstract. I think this, this draws you in. And indeed, if you went to the talk, you would, would have been pretty happy. Let's look at the next one. This is uh, David Rowe, uh, another very good speaker. And this one here is he's talking about open source digital radio. Again, I'll skip through to my next part here. At the first paragraph, he gives a background. He says, this is the background of the problem that I'm trying to solve. Then the next paragraph, he clarifies what the problem is. He says, there is a problem. Current two-way digital radio systems are based on proprietary closed source technology. And then he goes on to say, well, what are we doing about this? Well, a group of us ham radio innovators are fighting against this trend. Now, I mean, that, those are pretty emotive words, but they also draw you in, don't they? You want to see what this guy is talking about. And what's the takeaway again? The open source systems we've developed will be explained and demonstrated, including tips on how to get started with your own digital radio experiments. That's the takeaway, right? He's actually got a purpose for this talk. That's what makes it a great abstract. Measuring and improving open geo, geo performance by Carl Wirth. Again, you, you see there's a pattern here. He gives the background. He describes the problem, then he says, he gives a solution. Now, he's going to demonstrate this tool called API Trace, which is another way of, of doing performance tracing for this particular problem. I'll showcase some of the most significant recent performance improvements for Linux graphics. Ah, huh. cool. 
And finally, I, just because the, the, those other ones were quite technical, I wanted to give another one. Uh, and this one is from Lana. This is a, a talk that Lana's going to give on Friday, I think. Thursday. And uh, so here she is, and, and it says, ah, oh, this one is a little bit different. This one's about documentation. This one's about process. What place has that got in a Linux conference? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? It's topical. It's talking about agile development methods. I mean, that, that's, a topical, that's a topical thing. But it's talking about how it applies to documentation. Maybe we're a little bit, you know, is this going to work or not? But then you go down here and say, why should I go to this? Well, at the world's largest open source company, we've been using this model successfully. Huh, maybe that is interesting. But I'm still on the, you know, to be honest with you, I'm still a little bit on the, on the, law, on the border, whether this is going to work or not. Is this going to appeal to our delegates? The other thing that we do in Zookeeper is that we have the concept of a private abstract. This is the private abstract. So as well as doing a public abstract, you can submit the private abstract. And this is for the papers committee's eyes only. Sorry, Lana. Did you just ruin your like, pseudo-thunder <laughs> I, I, I had all my secrets are now out. I'm sorry. I, I, did, I did ask for permission. I did ask for permission before this. But uh, so this is the private abstract. And what she says is, is what to expect. Well, this is a hands-on talk where she's going to take the audience through a series of development sprints. OK, oh, creating a, sh a living shared document on the big screen. It's actually going to be in interactive talk. That's cool. And oh, it's going to be done with Lego. OK, that's, that's quite geeky and cool. That's, that's really nice. Um, huh. Oh, this has been run with much success for smaller audiences. Right, both developers and experienced technical writers. And will this work with our demographic? Yeah. Lana says it has, and she's done this talk before. So you can see how you can provide this information to the papers committee to give us an insight about what you're thinking and whether you know, we can make this work for LCA. Right, poor abstracts. What makes a poor abstract? Well, if you're not the subject matter expert, you know, um, even though, and I'm going to keep, uh, I'm going to pick on someone different. You know, even though Michael Steele here is a great speaker, if he gets up and tells us about the latest techniques in cavity prevention in dentistry, no one's going to come and listen, except maybe to laugh at him, right? Because he's not an expert in dentistry, right? So we shouldn't be talking about stuff that we're not an expert in. But even within the field of technology, we should talk to your area of expertise. Now, you might be the, the world's best kernel developer, but if you get up and talk about how to implement HTML5, you're going to have to prove to the papers committee that you know what you're talking about. Just because you're an expert in one area doesn't mean that you're qualified to speak on all areas. Right? So that's a poor abstract without clarification. I'll, I'll say that point there. Um, if your abstract isn't pitched well, if it's introductory, if it's sort of you know, lug level talk, or if it's a sales pitch. I remember back in um, one of our conferences, we had a guy from uh, a big hardware manufacturer, and he got up and he, and he gave this talk, and he was like a solution architect guy, and he's given this pre-sales pitch to the audience, and it's just like, you're missing the point, right? You've, you've turned everyone off, and not only are you not going to make any sales, but most of the people in the room are going to go, you've just wasted 45 minutes of my life, and I'm probably going to go to your competitor rather than you. And of course, now he's not going to come back to this conference, because I, I wouldn't have him back. Um, the other thing there is, you know, making your abstract understandable or relevant to LCA delegates. You know, we've had a number of abstracts over the years, and I'd love to put them up on the screen just so you can read them. But sometimes we've had, you know, 3,000 words, and the papers committee have read through it, and we've commented and said, I have no idea what this person's talking about. And then 10 or 12 people have all read the same abstract and said, what is going on? And they're like, you know, trying to guess what, what, the, what the abstract's actually about. Don't do that. Don't make it hard. And of course, just the basic stuff, you know, sentence length, paragraphs, spelling, grammatical, punctuation, capitalization, all those kinds of things, all very important, all take away from your good ideas if they're there. And the last one there is vaporware. We want to hear about stuff you've done, not about stuff that you promise that you'll do. Because there's nothing more embarrassing than getting up here at, in front of a lectern and saying, oh, I didn't get to write that code that I said I was going to do. Um, and, and I'll give you an example of, of this. I mean, th this has to be a really fine line. Because I was talking to Keith Packard uh, this week. And Keith was telling me that you know, uh, the way that our conference works is that we do our face-to-face uh, our -face meeting at the end of August. Okay? And the conference isn't to when? The first week in January. That's a long time, but we want stuff to be topical and relevant and up to date. 
So here's the thing, how do you, how do you put in an abstract for something that's going to happen in six months' time? Well, Keith was busily working on a number of changes to X, and he listed in his abstract, here are the things, and I actually talked to him and got his permission to talk about this, and he lists about seven or eight things that he wanted to demonstrate at LCA. So when he gives his talk, I think tomorrow or Friday, Here's the interesting thing. He says, you know what, Michael, I'm sorry. I only hit you know, seven of eight. I actually missed one. I'm not going to get one done. The code's sitting on my laptop. I've got to write a few more tests before I commit it. But that's, 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 for me, that is actually selling it you know, perfectly. He's got topical stuff that's up to date. He's a, he's a known good speaker. And he, he has actually committed the code that he said he was going to talk about, except for one small thing. Right? So we, don't, we want stuff that's relevant, that's, that's uh, topical, that's up to date, but don't talk about stuff that you want to get done you know, next year sometime, because we all know that this doesn't happen. You know, we all procrastinate and, and code doesn't get written. Examples of bad abstracts. Um, you know, I, I, when I put in my abstract myself, I said, oh, this is going to be cool. I've got so many bad abstracts, and it's going to be so funny. But then there's one small problem. Someone said to me, oh, yeah, don't do that, because you're going to get sued or something, rather. And, and, but the other point is, is I don't want to embarrass anyone in our community. You know, if you put in a bad abstract, I want you to learn from that and put something great in next time. I don't want anyone to feel bad. So the problem is, how do I show you what a bad abstract is without putting, without putting up bad abstracts on the screen? Because again, I, I tried. I tried to go through some, but you start scrubbing out bits of text and it's still obvious what the topic was about. So it's actually difficult. Use one of mine. Use one of Rusty's, no, the, there are no bad abstracts. Um, so what I did is I came up with this one. This is one from a couple of years ago, and this is the canonical worst abstract ever. Okay, um, and as you can see, there's not very much information on this, and so no one's going to feel embarrassed. Um, I do project name. This was the extent of the abstract. I do project name, and it was signed there IRC Nick. Now, what's wrong with this abstract? Ah, uh, what's going to be covered? What will the audience get from it? Is it open source? It doesn't really leave me wanting anymore, does it? And it doesn't tell a story. And, and who is this person, right? You've, you know, like, unless you knew what his nick was, you'd have no idea who it was, right? And that was it. Um, and all it does is get the papers committee offside. This person might have had a great thing to, you know, and actually, I actually know this, who this person is, and they contribute a lot of code. And they're obviously really busy, but they didn't have time to put an abstract in, so they gave us this. But all it does is just, you know, like, are we going to accept that? No, we wouldn't accept that, right? Because if I would much rather take someone else from the community who is completely unknown, who, who spent time putting together a well-crafted abstract, who actually spent some real effort on that, than, than that, all right? So, improving your chances. How do you improve your chances? Well, look at last year's program. There's much to understand from that. You know, you look at, look at the conference this week. You look at the, the kind of talks that are proposed, the depths of the talks. Find out what people think was good. You know, you might have one opinion, but other people will have other opinions too. There's, you know, there's blog posts, there's all the social media. Find out what, thing, what people were talking about and then go look at that. Go look at the abstract and it's like, ah, oh, right, that was a really good talk. This is what the abstract was and now I can go watch the video of what that person was. Learn from others, you know, learn from that experience, both with the abstracts and also the talks and, and learn about it. So really that bottom underline thing is, you know, think about why successful talks are successful. You've had a whole day full of talks today. Think about the ones that you really, what, what do you remember? Can you actually write down all the talks that you went to? Or have you already forgotten what some of them are? What stuck in your mind? What made that particular talk work for you? And then think about why. And then when you go to write your abstract, try to use that same idea. Oh, that drew me in because. That talk was exciting because. That abstract made me go to that because. The needle in the haystack. Um, there's a lot of us nowadays who, who, who work on open source, and even if we do it still as a hobby, there's lots of things that we work on. In 12 months, there's lots and lots of code that you write, and lots and lots of different things that you work on. And just because you work on a cool project, or talk on a project that has, we've had lots of talks at LCA before, doesn't mean that every single one of those ideas will turn into a great talk. So I guess the purpose of this slide is just to make you, it's just to encourage you to, to maybe write down a list of potential ideas about talks that you might want to put in. And then go through them and try to find that needle in the haystack. You know, think about those things that we've already talked about. What makes a good abstract? What do you think that other LCA delegates would really want to hear about? 
and then propose that one. And if you're not sure, you know, we don't mind as a papers committee that you put in two or three talk ideas. We'll only accept one from you, so don't worry about that. Unless you're, um, you know, Rusty or Keith Packard or Tridge, we'll only accept one, right? And no one else gets multiple talk slots. Um, but so, so you can put in multiple ideas, but really think about the one that's going to excite your audience and give them some takeaway and make sure you submit that one. Look for the needle in the haystack. So just about that abstract, you know, is it your own work? Is it fresh material? If you've given this talk four times already at, at PyCon in the States and PyCon AU and at OzCon, then perhaps don't put it into LCA. Um, but, but likewise, you know, if, if, if it is uh, something you've already presented somewhere else and you need to make it ready for LCA, that's fine. But think about what will draw LCA attendees to this talk and what's the message that you want to get across. And um, you know, we've got, you know, we're four or five streams wide. Why should someone come and see your talk face to face? You know, are you going to be an engaging speaker? Or are you just going to stand here and just read off your slide deck? If you're going to be an engaging speaker, then maybe people will come and see you rather than just watching the video. And of course, when it comes to abstracts, if you notice all the good examples I gave, they all fitted on one slide. That's because a good abstract doesn't need to be 3,000 words. In fact, if you think about our papers committee, if we've got 300 abstracts to review in a two-week period and you've given us 3,000 words, what's the chance that I'm going to be mentally awake by the time I got to the end. You need to, you need to draw me in, right? You need to suck me in with a good title and the first couple of paragraphs really need to excite me about what you want to talk about. So again, that, that flows into this side. So don't make it difficult for the papers committee. Now, at the end of the day, we want a successful talk more than we want a happy papers committee, but the way to get accepted is to make things easy for us. And that first point is probably the main one there. It says don't give us a reason to say no. You know, get all the low hanging fruit. Right? You know, make your talk grammatically correct. You know, use, use punctuation. Use paragraphs. Make it easy for us. And give examples about where you've spoken before and what your commits are, that, you, that you're a good speaker and that you've, you know your material. Make it hard for the papers committee that we'll read it and go, you know what, I've never heard of this person, but they've put in a really good abstract. I don't really have a choice but to accept it. And especially because we're always trying, always looking to try to get new talent involved. If you've got an abstract that, is, that, that looks great, you've got a pretty good chance of getting accepted. Just so, so take away all the low-hanging fruit. Take away all of the, all the things that get in the way and make it hard for us to say no to your abstract. And one way of making that happen is to just get some feedback on your abstract before it's submitting it. Okay? So talk to a friend, send them the abstract, get them to review it. That's what I did with my abstract for this, for this uh, conference here. I got some peers to uh, review that and give me feedback and I made some changes as a result. The last point on that slide is don't play chicken with the CFP dates. You know, if you spend all this time putting out a perfect abstract and the CFP has been open for three months and you give it to us three months plus a day, that's really frustrating because our reviewers have already started reviewing. And so now, as, as someone who's involved as a coach here, I've got to email all those reviewers and say, yeah, I've got another one. Can you please go back and do that one too? And even if it's a perfectly formed abstract, there's going to be a bias against you for, for, for frustrating us, right? And it's just, even it's just subconscious. So just take away the low-hanging fruit, as I keep saying. Just don't make it difficult for us, make it easy. And finally, this one here. You know, it's not just your abstract, it's also your bio. You know, it's good to explain who you are and why you stand out. What's specific about your background and experience that makes you a good speaker for this conference? Maybe it's you're new to the community and that you're able to bootstrap in and you're making code contributions after only six months. Maybe that's your thing. Or maybe you've been working in closed source for years, but now you've come into the open source community and you've got all this experience to bring with you. You need to tell us in your bio why we should accept you. You know, it's that whole thing, you know, a good subject matter expert plus a good speaker. We need to see who you are. The other point is, and maybe some of you, maybe some of some of you people might suffer from this. There's this thing called imposter syndrome, where you think maybe I'm not good enough to put an abstract in. I've been coming along to this conference for years, and oh man, there's all these superstars, all these rock star speakers, and I could never speak like them. I could never come to this conference and talk to people. That's just not me, and I'm just not good enough to do that. But you know what? If you sit down and write out your bio, it helps you to realise that you've probably got something to offer. I've been doing this. I've made these contributions to this project. I've been working in this community. I've been helping out in this way. And so by doing that, you actually you can build yourself up. You can make yourself realize it's like, huh, 
Maybe I can come and speak at this conference. If I put in a good abstract, maybe I can. So, you know, that's one way for you guys to overcome any concerns you've got about your own ability. So where to from here? And this is, uh, kind of, this is pretty much my last slide. And this is a, a picture of um, a marathon. And of course, when anyone runs a marathon, um, with the exception of uh, Steve Hanley, no one else can just put on a pair of sneakers and go run a marathon, right? No one can, right? Is anyone here who can just throw on a pair of sneakers and go for a marathon this afternoon? No. Michael, still, okay, thank you. <laughs> Lies, I tell you. Yeah. Um, the, the fact is, is that no one can run a marathon without any preparation, right? No one can run a marathon on the first attempt. The way to start running a marathon is, first of all, to get some sneakers and to go for a walk. And then you run one kilometer, and then you run two kilometers, and then you do a couch to 5K, and then finally you work your way up and you do a 10K, and then you do a half marathon, and then, if you really want to, you can become a marathon runner. But most people who run marathons, you know, when they started, it was a goal that was so distant, and they thought they'd never be able to get there. It come, it's the same when it comes to public speaking, and it's the same when it comes to speaking at this conference. Take those little steps first. Perhaps the first thing you need to do is look at the things that you have been working on and put together a talk and speak at your local Linux user group or your Python user group or your Perlmungers or your OpenStack meetup or whatever the local technical community in your city is. Maybe start speaking there. And then you go, this is for me or maybe it's not. Maybe then you can go, huh, maybe I can start giving some longer presentations. And then you can come and then you put a proposal in to come to this conference. You work your way up. The other thing with running, and, and this is something that um, you know I've done. You know I've I've done a bit of running, but you know what? Sometimes there's setbacks. Um, I've I've got an Achilles heel injury at the moment, which is stopping me from running. Um, you have setbacks sometimes, right? You put in an abstract to a conference and you get rejected. But does that mean that you give it up? No. It just simply means that you work through it and you submit again. And that's what I really want to encourage you guys. May, you know, a lot of you put up your hand and you said you were rejected putting a, a, a submission into the CFP. What I really want to see is you try again. Take some of the things that we've talked about today, put in an, get an abstract together for next year's conference and put that in. And take away the reason for the papers committee to reject you, right? Don't give up, try again. You can, you can become a, um, a speaker at our conference. It's just a case of, learning from the experience of others and giving it a shot. And then you can be up here next year instead of me. Um, just to finish off, I'll just point out this. This is just a whole bunch of thank yous and links. Uh, over the years, a lot of different people have spoken about this conference and how to get papers accepted. There's a bunch of links there on the screen. You can go read those in your own time. Uh, and finally, here's our attributions for all of those photos. And finally, just want to say thank you that you would come and hear me rabble on for such a while. And uh, given that this is um, the last talk of the day, it's uh, good that you came to listen. So thank you very much. We've, we've still got time for any questions. So, um, yes, Michael. It's kind of a non question, but what are your thoughts on the fact that it's also a numbers game, right? The no matter what you do, the rejection rate is 50%. It's not always about you. Sure, sure. Um, that, is, that is a true thing. Yeah, sorry. Um, so, well, I can hear you. Uh, so, Michael just asked a question about, uh, because we have so many submissions, uh, the rejection rate is high. And in some years, it is quite high. You know, sometimes we're only accepting, you know, 30% of submissions. In other years, it's 50%. So, it means that a lot of people do miss out. Uh, what I'll say to that is that we talked about balance early on, and we talked about balance in the composition of the papers committee. We also look at uh, balance in the speakers who come to this conference. Okay, so, uh, and the other thing is that we do have a preference towards new talent as well. We do want to see new people come and speak at this conference. So, uh, even though there are some faces that come back time and time again, uh, I would encourage people to keep on submitting because uh, we want to see diversity, we want to see new faces. So, uh, if you like, take away our reason to say no to your abstract. That's what I would say. Next one. Yeah. If you put a link on your abstract page that it works, I would assume you have to keep your slices down. Your Michael Levy is not working. Yes, I do know that. <laughs> Repeat the outage. So, uh, 
My personal website sitting the end of an ADSL tail is currently down because as what happens uh, just about many, many years, uh, I had a power failure at home. And, uh, and of course, it's waiting for me to go home and to fix whatever has broken. Uh, the slides will be, uh, there are, I will be giving them to the conference, and so they're, they're on the conference site as well. Um, but they'll also be on my personal site, yes, which is michaeldavies.org. Yes, uh, Rusty. So what's more important, uh, ability to speak uh, and present, or knowledge about the subject matter? Yes. <laughs> uh, what's, sorry, I should repeat the question. What's most, more important, uh, the ability to speak or uh, subject matter expert? Um, gee, that's, that is a tough one. Um, you know, personally, I struggle going to a talk where someone might be very deeply technical but can't get their ideas across. That's really hard. You know, like you, you've, sat, you've sat in the middle row and all the, the room is crowded and once a person starts speaking, you realise I'm not going to be able to get very much out of this talk. That, that's pretty hard. But on the other side, you don't really want to hear a Muppet get up and, and start rambling on and, and realise I don't know anything either. So we, we really do try to get both, you know, and um, that doesn't really answer your question, but uh, I think different people have got different you know, opinions on what they think is better. Oh, yes, I'll but, your opinion, your Okay. What is your opinion, Rusty? If we have to choose, in the past we've chosen uh, deep subject matter expertise, because even if their talk is a bit meh, um, their presence at the conference brings something. So that usually... Is yeah. Yep. Uh, so Rusty said he has a preference for subject matter expertise, um, and you know I, I would agree. Um, but you know, really, we do try to optimise both. Um, you know, I, I, and I guess I, I guess I'll say this: um, for people who uh, whose language is not English as their first language, you know, we do want to know that they can communicate well to this audience because we are here in Australia, and the majority of people are English speaking only. Um, so we want to make sure that they can communicate to an English speaking audience. Um, without trying to be discriminatory in any way, but we want to make sure that they can communicate to our delegates. Um, yes? Uh, so what's the likelihood of being able to extract some of the information back out of Zookeep and going to the people who are uh, putting in the CFPs? Yep. Um, so as I, as I had in my... Uh, sorry, thank you. Uh, the question was, how do I get feedback? You guys rejected my talk. How do I know what was wrong with it? Was that fair? Yep. yep. That was a summarisation. Um, so uh, I would say uh, you can, there is a, uh, a mailing list which is the uh, chair of the papers committee, the, the co-chairs, and uh, we will happily provide feedback. Um, now it's a bit of work for us, but we, we will do it. We'll give you feedback. We'll, we'll look at those comments that our reviewers have made and we will filter that back to you uh, to try to help you to improve. You know, I'm very happy to do that because again, the idea is I want new people to present and to do a great job and to put in great abstracts. So we're happy to give feedback. Um, as you can imagine, our reviewers, uh, when they write information in, they're not, they're not writing in such a way it's not going to bruise your ego. They'd, they'd, they'll be brutal in their review comments, but we're happy to filter that through in a way that will be nice. Sure. I think the thing that I'm probably more comfortable with is just, just giving you, they were, they were questioning whether you were an expert in that area or that there's some problems with this with the abstract. We'll probably give you some um, uh, qualitative uh, feedback rather than quantitative. Okay. Is there time for one more? Anyone have a question? At the back. Sorry, can you repeat that question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, you know, getting involved, how I started with this conference, uh, as, and so the question was, how do I get involved if I, haven't, if I don't want to speak? You know, how else can I contribute? And I think, really, the thing is, is put your hand up and help out at this conference. You know, um, not, not, to, not to take the thunder away from this current organising team, but they, it's, a, it's a big team. They have, um, you know, there's two or three guys at the, at the top of the pyramid who are, who are taking on the responsibility of this whole conference this week. Uh, then they have a, a core team of people around that, and then we have a whole bunch of uh, support helpers. You know, and so I'm not sure how, what the numbers are, but there might be 30, 40 people who are performing some function in this conference this week. 
and the way to get involved, and you don't have to be actually in the city. So it doesn't matter where this conference goes next year. We've got out-of-towners who are helping out with video. We have out-of-towners out of who are prepared to stand up in lecture theatres just like this and to do the introduction and water and all that sort of stuff. So you get involved in those ways, and that can lead to much more. Um, and that's how uh, pretty much all of the people who are involved in the Papers Committee, at least, have all, have all been involved pretty much in, in, involved in this conference. Uh, through that kind of mechanism, by helping to put on an LCA in other ways, and, and showing their relationships to the, uh, this community. I'll, I'll add on to that. Been involved in the local Yes. Yeah. That's fantastic. That's a great idea, James. So just to repeat that, uh, James suggested that the best thing you can do is get involved in your local user group, which is fantastic. Yes, Brianna. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, the statement there was uh, help out in a mini conf. You know, a mini conf in, in some ways is the training ground for the main conference. So uh, if you're involved, and again, they have their own call for papers. They have their own paper selection. So if that's something that interests you, um, get involved with the mini conf, and I'm sure they'll appreciate that help, and um, we'll go from there. Anyway, thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank All you right. Have a good night, everyone.